Good morning, Bethel Ranch. Good to be here this morning. Thankful for just even a little bit of rain yesterday. Every drop was precious. And we thank the Lord for it. And we realize how we need our Lord, how he sustains us in every way. And we are grateful and thankful for that. So <clears throat> welcome this morning, our announcements. Uh, on the uh, overhead. And um, Father's Day, very, very important day. <laughs> Next week. And then the last uh, Sunday, the 25th, will be our monthly potluck. So don't forget about that either. Our psalm today is Psalm 100. Psalm 100 is only five verses, but it is a powerful, powerful psalm. And it really focuses upon thanksgiving and praise, but also on excitement, exuberance. And think about this as people, the Israelites, were going into the temple. This was their attitude. It's the same kind of attitude we want to have as we come to worship too. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Some translations translate that. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. And we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all the generations, from all the generations before that time, that time, down through today to us. God is good. Amen? Amen? God is good. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you this morning for your mercy, your goodness, your love for us, your watch care over us. Many things concern us these days, but one thing doesn't, and that is that you love us, you care about us, and you are always looking for our good, and we praise you, and we thank you for it. As we come to this service this morning, may we be full of joy. May we be making a joyful, thankful noise to the Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with me and prepare to make a joyful noise as we sing the opening songs, Wonderful Grace of Jesus and Macedonia.
Epistle reading today is from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 15. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. What a power-packed verses and wonderful theology that is. We're going to go to our Lord in prayer now, and we want to begin with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Just think how many times over the years I was thinking of this, that you've said the Lord's Prayer. And you know, it's, it's a glorious, wonderful prayer each and every time that we pray it. Father, we praise you, we thank you for creation's glory. We thank you, Father, for identifying with us so that we might be able to identify with you. We don't always understand your workings, but we know that whatever happens in our lives, you love us, you're always there for us, you're always working for us our good and your glory. Father, today we want to pray for those that are still uh, grieving loss. Pray, Lord, that you give them comfort and hope from our gentle shepherd, Jesus. Thinking of Shelly Hughes and her family and Kay Sam Laska and her family and Kay Ranslow and her family and Teresa Hart and her family. And Father, we pray for healing, some for physical needs, some for emotional needs, some for relationship breakdowns. I just pray your blessing, your strength, your encouragement to each one. Thank you, Father, for the news that Linda Lignata's vehicle that was stolen has been found. 
We pray that it will come back undamaged. Pray, Lord, for Compassion International, for our young people, Lord, that we are supporting by both prayer and financially. Pray for Francis in the Philippines and Miriam in Tanzania. Pray you'll keep them from harm, from exploitation. Pray you'll bless them, protect them. May the word of God be available to them to hear and to uh, read, Lord. Thank you for them. Father, we pray for the village of Arai, for the wonderful well that they now have. Pray for clean water for them and uh, pray that the well will continue to operate uh, properly. And we pray for a Christian witness in that Muslim village that people might come to know Jesus. And Father, we pray for pregnancy options this morning. And now that funding has been cut by the government, uh, by the state government, Lord, I, I pray that they will have their needs met because they have a vital function for young women who uh, are needing direction on what to do in that situation. Thank you, Father, this morning for every church in this community, across this great nation that is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. Pray that hearts will be open and that the word of God will be effective in them. Pray that that will be true in our life too now as Pastor Dan brings the message that you've laid on his heart, first for the children and then for all of us. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm moment of honesty here. How many of you have ever been guilty of a spelunking? Though there's at least two of you know what it is. <laughs> you know, um, spelunking, okay, this, this, this is a lot of fun to do, but apparently, is if you can find a cave, um, and you better have a flashlight and just on yourself by, by, by yourself or with a friend you just go crawling around and discovering this what's inside this cave but that's what that is now I will tell you right now I would never go how about that again spelunking I wouldn't I wouldn't do it now, I love caves. I have been in many caves. I've been in caves that were a mile down. I have walked through caves that were over a mile in, 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 in walking. You go into a cave and you'll see some of God's artwork. Beautiful stuff. Hard to believe. And there's adventure. You never know what you're going to find around the next bend. You might come around a corner and there are bats all over the ceiling flying around. You, you, just, you, you never know what you're going to find. It's an adventure. I love caves. But I'm not going to do it if I don't have a guide who's got a light who has been in that cave many times before. So that I am sure that I'm not going to get lost. I'm not going to fall into a hole. I'm not going to get stuck someplace. I'm going to get out. Well, I love caves, but I'm not going to do that for one thing because you don't have any of that. Now, the reason I'm telling you about this is because I've discovered that life is like that. You never know in life what's going to be around the next corner. You never know. Wonderful things, terrible things, 
dangerous things, happy things. You just never know what's going to come around the next corner. I sure don't want to do it without a guide. But the reason why we're here this morning is because we have a guide. And he is going to take us through this cave of life. Now the one thing that's kind of interesting about this cave of life is that none, nobody gets out of it alive. Nobody does. But if we have this guy who gave his life and rose again from the dead, we know that when we get to the end of the cave, however, whatever we've experienced it, we're going to emerge in his wonderful home. That is, you like that news? Yeah. yeah, that's good news. Let's sing a little song about this guy who is really our shepherd. Gentle shepherd, stand as we sing. Well, if you've been around Faribault for almost no time at all, you'll discover one thing. Faribault has a labor shortage. You can't go anywhere without seeing big signs, hiring. And some of these companies are begging you to, they, they're, they're going to, they'll pay you a big bonus just for signing on. There's one company I know of, a big company, that will pay your college education. Come to work for them. I mean, it's just, um, everybody's trying to find people to, to work. And, and I think one of the reasons they're building all these wonderful apartment houses is they need to be able to attract people to come and work in our industries and in our businesses. Faribault has a labor shortage. Well, from the text that I'm going to read this morning, Jesus talks about a labor shortage. And he is absolutely passionate about it. He opens his heart in these just short few verses about this labor shortage that to him is so critical. Now, when we read the passage, I gave I didn't give Steve quite the whole passage. And so I'm going to read to you. I'll start it out. It's from Matthew 9. And I'll start out with the verse that is not on the wall. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, 
but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Reading Matthew's account, this very brief account, it, there are some things that um, Matthew noticed, which is he wants, he put it here because he wants us to see it. There are some things about Jesus that really show his heart, that show his passion. One of them, he is touring all of these villages and, 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 and towns. They're, they're not very big. I mean, nothing anywhere close to as big as Faribault. Probably not much of anything as big as Kenyon. You know, and it just, um, they're, they're, they're small places. And the center of each one of these towns, the gathering place, the civic center, is going to be the synagogue. And so Jesus is touring these towns. And, and he goes from synagogue to synagogue to synagogue, and then other places you realize he also spends time in homes and in neighborhoods and workplaces and celebrations and things like that. But what is he doing? He's going to gathering places because he is searching for people. He is not waiting for them to come to him. He's searching for them. And Matthew would tell us today, if he was here, nothing has changed. He is still searching for his people. Now, in, in Jesus' specific ministry as coming as the Messiah, he was focusing on Jewish people. people to which he had been sent. But he was looking for them. The second thing that Matthew saw is that Jesus saw people. Now, he, he, it was big crowds. The crowds were real large. Sometimes. But Jesus saw the people. Now, you think about, think about this. It's true of me, and I know it's true of you, that when we see, you know, when we think about collections of people, the city of Faribault, you group people, I group people. You can't help it. And in grouping them, I do what you're not supposed to do, but profile them. So when you think about those 2,000 men up in the prison, or you think about the Four Seasons community right next to my house. And all of those, you know, the Somali people there. And you think about, you go by the schools. Or you go by nursing homes. I mean, you go by businesses. What, what do you do? You can't help but group people. Well, this is what these people are like. This is what these people are like. This is what these people are like. I mean, we just do that. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but we do it. Jesus' disciples would have done that. They saw the big crowds. And what are they thinking? Well, they see people and they would say, well, there's obviously these guys are fishermen. These guys are farmers. Um, you know, these guys are tax collectors. These guys are artisans. You know, they, they could group them. And then he would think about, about um, religion. And, and they think, well, some of these people, they're, gonna be, they're really serious about, about the Jewish religion and keeping all the rules. Then there's a much larger group of people who are like most Christians today, actually. They're practical about it. I mean, they're, they're, they're religious. I mean, they believe these things, but, you know, they just kind of make it 
fit into their lives. They're practical about it. There they are. And then there are going to be some who probably have some pretty odd ideas. But they're still, you know, they're, they're still serious. And then there are those people who are simply excluded. The tax collectors, by vocation, the tax collectors are going to be excluded. And then there's people who are excluded because of a disease, leprosy, or even mental incapacity, you know, demon possession, that kind of stuff. I mean, they're just excluded from this, this, this life of, 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 of this religious life of Israel. And then the large number of people, there are those people who are excluded simply because of the moral choices they're making. They're just messy, you know, it's just the way it is. And you know, when we, when we group people, some of them we're going to be very, you know, very happy about, you know, I like to be, know these people and you like to associate with them. And there are people that you just really respect, though you may never be able to associate with them. And then there are those people that you're kind of angry at or you're afraid of. And almost always, in one way or another, you're making judgments. Isn't that true? That's just us. But it wasn't Jesus. He saw all these people who were attracted to him. He knew full well some of them were there because they're hoping he is the, the coming Messiah. Many of them are there because they just want healing. People there because of, you know, their political things. Maybe Jesus is going to be a, you know, throw off the Roman government. Some people are just curious. Yeah, I mean, some guy's doing miracles, you'd be curious. Well, all these people, they're attracted to Jesus. And he saw the crowd. And what he saw was all of these people... He saw them in light of their need. And he was seeking to draw them to himself as the good shepherd. That's how Jesus saw them. But he saw them in another way. Matthew uses the deepest Greek word you can use for it. Deep compassion on all of these people. He, I'm not talking about, oh, you poor dear. That's a sentiment. There was none of that in Jesus. I thought about the time that my boy, we'd just gotten back from vacation and, and we'd skip, we, we'd miss some ball games that, that, that my boys were signed up for. And you know, and so my, but my boys were on the team. We get there, and what does the coach do? He knows the boys are there, but he plays a couple of other kids who are playing on another team, and he, he brings them in. So my boys weren't playing. Well, I didn't like that. My oldest son, he got in for one inning, and he hit a home run, and it was the only score for that team the whole game. And then he took him out of the game. And at the, at the last inning, he signaled from my youngest son that, you know, that he'll be batting. But unfortunately, there are two or three guys batting ahead. And you can guess what happened. My boy's out there practicing his swing and all that. And the guy before him struck out and the game was over. He came back to the bench crying. I was angry. I was hurt. I was passionate. And when it says that Jesus was passionate about these people, all of them, that's what he's talking about. It's a passion that means I'm going to do something. Well, I didn't do anything in that case, but I'm going to do something. That was Jesus. Two pictures that came to his mind. 
And he shared them with his disciples because he wanted them to see this as he sees it. And the first picture, it very common, both of them very common in that day. They wouldn't be common as much in this day, but in that day they really were. They came out of the Old Testament, but they were right out of life. That was a sheep, a sheep herding area. And so he's telling them, imagine, I, what am I seeing? I'm seeing a, a hillside with sheep just wandering here and there and everywhere. They've got no shepherd. They're in danger. They're in danger from thieves. They're in danger from, from wild animals. They're in danger from, from terrible terrain. They're in danger and lack of food. I mean, all this kind of stuff. Can you see them? They need a shepherd. Has anything changed? Harassed and helpless. And you look around at our own culture. Ask the basic questions of life in our culture. Who am I? Why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Is there a God? Is it any wonder why overdosing on drugs and committing suicide are the two major causes of death in our culture? The wealthiest culture the world has ever known. Are we harassed and helpless? The second picture. that we could identify with this, a field ripe for harvest. The problem is, is that they didn't have tractors. It was labor intensive harvest. And kind of like parable. Picture this wonderful harvest and the one who has planted it and he doesn't have the laborers to harvest it. The people who would respond to the good shepherd if they only heard the good news. But there's no one to tell them. And so, I don't know if it's surprising to you or not, but the first thing Jesus does, he doesn't tell them to his 12 disciples, you got to get out there. You got to tell them. Now he will tell them that later, but that's not what he tells them right at first. What does he tell them? Out of the passion of a compassionate heart, ask, pray, beg. The Lord of the harvest to send out workers to work to take in that harvest. Plead with him. Why would you have to do that? Because it is God who calls and sends laborers. In our church in Seattle, today. That church has the wonderful opportunity to commission Paul and Alexa Frazier as our new missionaries to Japan. Called by God, sent by God, commissioned by the church. 
It is God who calls. He sends. Why? Because you have to have his compassion, his heart of compassion for that harvest. Or you won't be worth much. Another reason. Let's face it, there are barriers. There are barriers of language. It's kind of pointless for me to decide to go to the Four Seasons housing complex, you know, a block from my house. Because I can't speak their language. Besides that, it's a culture that's entirely different. And you know something else? There are other places that I can't go. I can't go to the, reach those 2,000 guys up there on the hill in the prison. I can't go there. I can't go into the high school. And you know, it's true of all of us. I can't go to Japan. Well, I could have at one time, I suppose, but I was a pastor instead. But you know, there are six things I can't, or I can't go. What am I going to do? I'm going to plead with God to send people who can go. And then support them when they come. And then, as we pray, as we plead with the Father to send laborers into his harvest, pray with his open heart to the people that he would send you to reach. Language is never a problem. Well, in a sense it is, but in another sense it's not a problem. Because there is one language that every group, every person, in every group can understand. It's the good news of the kingdom of God, of a shepherd king who gave his life for his sheep, his death laying the foundation of a kingdom established in righteousness, a good news of the power of God to save any because Jesus did not come to preach judgment we ought not to either Jesus came to tell people how to be saved from judgment that's the gospel and father Jesus, your son was passionate about this. Pray eagerly. As people who are searching, as people who can see people, as they really are, who can pray with compassion, Father, that's what you called us to do. Jesus pled with us to do it. Will we do it? Amen. Let's sing a wonderful hymn about this good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. My shepherd will supply my need. Let's stand as we sing.
Stand for the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. Our doxology. Amen.